This is Science 2034. 20 years ago, the Science Coalition was formed to strengthen federal support for basic scientific and engineering research. We tell the stories of what federally funded research has made possible and what will be reality 20 years from now. Our guest today, Dr. Francis Collins, a pioneer in genomic research and the director of the National Institutes of Health. Well, I think history would say that the nation that has made investments in research, and this is the 21st century, so it's really biological and biomedical research that is the main driver, uh, is the nation that has led both in terms of economic benefits, uh, opportunities for their citizens to get engaged in really interesting jobs. Uh, it's a winner all the way around. I don't in any way want to say it's a bad thing that other countries are also revving up their efforts in biomedical research, and some of them certainly are. Look at China, India, Singapore, Brazil, and so on. That's all good as long as the data is made accessible and everybody who's got a good idea on the planet can begin to use it. But that's not the whole story. Uh, the country that is engaged in this in the most vigorous way will be the one where all the spin-offs happen in terms of advances in health that come along quicker, in terms of small businesses that spin out of the discoveries that are happening, in terms of vigor of the universities, which is where students want to go uh, to train and to learn how to be scientists themselves. And why would we, at this point, after having enjoyed that kind of leadership, want to walk away from the stage just when it's really getting interesting. Because the next 20 years, going up to 2034, are going to be full of exciting revelations about how life works, how disease occurs, and what we can do about it. Well, I have to talk about precision medicine, because it seems to me that's the path we're on for so many di different areas uh, of health. The idea that we are all individuals and that we have the chance to figure that out with very precise measures of our inheritance, our genomes, our environmental exposures, our health practices, all kinds of imaging capabilities, the advent of electronic health records to keep track of things, the use of cell phone technologies to be able to track individual physiological parameters uh, as we're going about our daily lives, all of this information coming together. And along with that, the discoveries about pathways involving in disease that lead us to much more targeted therapies than the current ones, which are oftentimes a bit clumsy, then you have the opportunity for each of us uh, to have a kind of individualized plan for how to stay healthy, a wellness plan that's not just one size fits all, but it's for the individual. And then if that doesn't work and you end up falling ill with some disease, whether it's cancer or diabetes or the first signs of Alzheimer's, there is a personalized strategy for you based upon this intimate knowledge of your biology that's going to work. That is a glorious potential future. It's something we're beginning to glimpse in some areas, maybe particularly now for cancer, but it should become the norm over the next 20 years. It is interesting to think back to 1990 when the Human Genome Project was being proposed. It was clearly a risky endeavor. A lot of people thought it was never going to be possible, at least not within our lifetimes, to actually read out all three billion letters of the human DNA code because at that time the technology was woefully inadequate. So you had to place some big bets in terms of being able to expand that technology, increase its speed, reduce its cost. The United States took the lead along with some very important international partners. It was a worldwide effort, but we did more than half of the work as the guy who had the privilege of serving as the field general of this whole enterprise, I think uh, one can say now with great confidence, this was an enormous benefit uh, to America that we were in that role. And when you look at the economic benefits, my goodness, recent calculation that in fact that three or four billion dollars that were put into the US part of the Human Genome Project yielded in the next 10 years after its completion, close to a trillion dollars of economic growth. 178 to 1 return on investment recently calculated by Battelle. That's a pretty nice example. We wouldn't want to miss those big opportunities going forward in the next 20 years either. And we have to think hard about which ones are those and how can we be sure we're ready for them and ready to jump in and take advantage of the opportunity.
Part of my job is to look over this landscape of biomedical research opportunity and to identify those really exceptional opportunities that if we pushed a little harder uh, could turn into something like the Genome Project, really a revelatory kind of changes in our understanding of biology and applications to medicine. I would say right now an area that many of us are very excited about and which is featured on my tie, I might point out, <laughs> is the brain. The Brain Initiative, uh, announced by the President in April uh, of last year, and it gives us the opportunity uh, to bring technologies to bear on this incredibly important and challenging question of how do the circuits in the human brain actually work? How do you lay down a memory and retrieve it? How do you process information? Uh, what's consciousness all about? These seemed so completely out of reach a few years ago, and now here in the U.S., as a result of basically claiming this as the moment, this brain initiative over the next 12 years aims to try to answer those questions. This is high risk. It is going to have all kinds of interesting spin-offs in terms of development of new technologies and certainly in terms of medical applications to things like autism and schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease and traumatic brain injury, all conditions where we really need a better foundation of understanding how those 86 billion neurons in your brain do what they do. And we're just audacious enough now to imagine that we might be able to tackle that. We are faced with serious fiscal issues in our nation. And I would think, therefore, that the most important question anybody would ask about a government investment is, what do you get for this? And in that regard, medical research comes out extremely compelling. If you look over the last several decades in terms of what this has done for the health of our nation, deaths from heart attack are down by more than 60 percent in the last 40 years. Deaths from stroke down by more than 70 percent. HIV AIDS, which was a death sentence 20 years ago, uh, now associated pretty much with a normal lifespan if you have access to those medicines that were developed by NIH working with the private sector. So we have an incredible track record here of improvements in health. We also have an incredible track record in terms of economics. Various estimates, every dollar that NIH puts into grants that go out to those great institutions across the country return more than $2 in that first year in terms of economic growth. So this is a pretty good way at a time where we're all wanting to see the economy grow to see that happen. Put that together, and if you were trying to figure out how to pull a nation out of an economic slowdown and save lives, this is the way to do it. My own career was what you might call nonlinear. I started out as a chemist. That's what my PhD was in, physical chemistry. And then I got excited about biology and decided not only did I want to change my field of science, I wanted it to be closer to humanity. So I went to medical school. And then I did a residency in internal medicine. And then I did a fellowship in human genetics to figure out how to put the scientific bench part of this together with clinical applications. It was a wild adventure. It took a long time. But then I had the point uh, arrive where it was time for me to run an independent research lab and chase after ideas. And I was interested in tackling some pretty risky, difficult problems, like trying to find the cause of cystic fibrosis. I had the confidence that if I applied myself, if I had a, an approach that seemed like it might work, that I could put those ideas in front of peer reviewers at the NIH and they would support them, and they did. And it was three years from the time I started a faculty position until I had much to show for it because it was a risky kind of effort. But ultimately, that did lead uh, with wonderful collaborators to the discovery of the cystic fibrosis gene, the Huntington's disease gene, and quite a few others. I worry that today, somebody like me thinking about tackling a risky project like that where it might fail or there might be nothing to show for it for three or four years, might really be discouraged from taking that on. And if we're thinking about 2034, it's those kinds of efforts today that are going to make 2034 what we want it to be, a time of great excitement, discovery, and human benefit. There are so many areas of potential now. And I guess I would want any scientist who's just getting started out who might be listening to this 
uh, not to pay too much attention to those discouraging words about the difficult times that we've been going through in terms of fiscal support. We'll get through this. We'll get a corner turned. It's so compelling. Even a dysfunctional system occasionally, as Winston Churchill once said about the Americans, uh, we'll get it right after exhausting all the other options. Uh, we will figure out how to support this effort. If you've got a great idea, if you've got a vision and a passion for pursuing it, if you want to understand something fundamental about how life works, anything from basic to clinical, there's a place for you. We need you. The future is going to be awesome.